Hello, I'm John Humphreys, and this is 27 Unsolved. Trisha Lynn Reitler was a freshman psychology major at Indiana Wesleyan University in Marion, Indiana. The date was March 29th, 1993. Studying and writing a term paper, Trisha decided to take a break and walk to the Marsh supermarket. It was just a few blocks away from her college dorm. She purchased a soda and a magazine, and after leaving Marsh, she was never seen again. With police finding evidence left behind, suspects giving confessions, and possible leads, the mystery of Trisha Reitler's disappearance remains unsolved. My name is Heather France, and I'm a licensed private investigator. Um, I own RH Private Investigations, but I'm also a um, fraud investigator as well. I have been looking into the Trisha Reitler case since the case started many years ago. Um, I heard about it, I believe, I want to say the newspaper or on the news. And from that moment that I heard about it, I felt a connection to her. And I've looked into it and been interested ever since. I feel like this case is solvable even this many years later because there's still somebody that knows what happened to her. I believe the, the person or persons that contributed to her missing are still alive, possibly incarcerated, and I believe they know the facts and they know the truth and they know the answers. I do feel putting fresh eyes on this case would do wonders for this case. It is considered active, however, in my mind it's a cold case technically because the files, nothing new has been released. Uh, we don't have any other details than we did 20 plus years ago. So I feel like not even necessarily turning the file over or, or giving every piece of evidence, which would obviously not be intelligent, um, we still could do more with more details, even just a little bit of more details. I recognize this man in the photo as Larry Hall. Uh, I'm very familiar with Larry Hall and his twin brother, Gary Hall. I've actually had conversations and I've done my own interviews with Gary Hall, his identical twin brother. And actually, I grew up one street away from them uh, for many years. Uh, we just lived one, one street from them where they grew up as well. So I have a connection to this case also from, from that aspect. But yes, this is, this is Larry Hall. I've heard so many stories and talked to actual victims, and I say victims in the sense of stalking victims, that Larry um, drove his van around Wabash and he stalked them. Um, they got away. But there's something evil or dark when I look at the picture, and so I feel like there's more to this than what meets the eye with him and possibly his brother. I feel like the police did follow up with some leads with Larry. Um, I do know he was called in um, on multiple occasions um, from females, young females, parents in Wabash. They followed up in Marion. However, they thought he was just a person who was trying to brag and they said well he recanted his stories or he said it was in a dream um, and I feel like more follow-up was needed um, especially when Trisha went missing I feel like they just kind of let him go and after speaking with his brother um, I was told which that evidence was returned to the family I don't know if that's a fact or not, but I feel like more follow-up was needed, and I feel like even more follow-up now is needed. Unfortunately, we're this many years out, and he's pretty set in his stories. Larry Hall is serving a life sentence at a medium security federal prison in Butner, North Carolina, after being convicted in a 1993 kidnapping of 15-year-old Jessica Roche near Georgetown, Illinois. Larry Hall grew up in the Wabash area, living in two different Wabash areas, the Falls Cemetery and 300 block of Grant Street. Hall's family lived the Sexton House on the cemetery grounds. 
Paul and his twin brother Gary grew up watching their father work as a grave digger. Both homes Hall lived in are no longer standing today. Hall has confessed to multiple abductions, rapes, and murders, recanting every confession. Despite having confessed to multiple violent crimes, including the unsolved disappearance of Trisha Reitler, Hall has never been convicted of murder. We met with a woman who was at the Marsh Supermarket on March 29, 1993, and this is what Sarah Lewis recalled from that day. I was getting out of my car to go into Marsh's, and there was a van parked on the side of Marsh's, and it was like back a parking place to where you couldn't like really see it unless she was out. And as soon as I got out and started walking up to the store, the guy got out of the van and started walking towards the store himself. And it just made me feel really uncomfortable. Um, I went back to my car, I got in, I locked the doors and I left. And as I was leaving, I seen him return to his car without even going in the store. It was either this parking place or this parking place that he was parked in. Because I remember seeing it from my car. When I, before I had pulled up to Marsh's, I was coming from South Selby Street, um, where my uncle lives, and I was coming down the road here, and on the right hand side there used to be basketball courts. And there was, like, I don't know how many, there was a group of guys there playing basketball though. Um, it was almost getting to where it was dusk out. My best friend's dad was on the sheriff's department, so I felt more comfortable going straight to the sheriff's department because he worked for them. But it was just kind of like, I mean, they sat down and listened to me, but they never came back and asked me any more questions. They didn't, it was just like, I don't know, it was like they didn't care or I was making something up or... I'm not exactly sure what their object was, but they never even contacted me again after I told them about this, the scenario that happened that night. I just thought it should have been me. It was supposed to have been me because like I seen this guy coming out and it reminded me so much of when I was followed when I was like seven or eight years old in Hill's department store and it looked like the same guy. Investigative journalist Jackie Vest found a man by the name of Thomas Rawlings. Vest found that Rawlings had video footage of March 29, 1993, around the same time frame and area that Trisha had been reported last seen. This footage is also in with police evidence. We meet with Rawlings and he describes what he remembered being at the park with his daughter and wife that day. Back when uh, this all happened, this parking lot now was all grass field. Uh, the access road over here, where the main drive is coming into the university now, uh, it wasn't there. There was fences around the area. This was playground equipment over here. Had the bouncy toys and a swing set. And there was a basketball court back over here on this side to my, in the parking lot there. Uh, that's changed a little bit. Uh, they, uh, you know, it was, it was a fairly warm day. We could, uh, we, we wore jackets, a little, a light jacket. It was, it was that, it was that nice out. It was, everybody was, you know, ready for spring. So it was a pretty nice day. My wife had gotten off work at the VA. Uh, she came home. We, I was home with the kid already, with, with my daughter, youngest daughter, or my, my oldest daughter, and uh, we uh, decided we'd take a walk, and we put her in a stroller, and we walked out the door. I got about a half a block from the house and said, hey, I gotta get my video camera. So I went back and got the old style VHS. It looked like you know a TV station camera, it was big. And uh, so we took a little bit of video coming down the street, and then we walked on over to the playground over here, uh, came around the side of the building. And, uh, we got on the swing set first, I guess, and she swung back and forth on it for a while. I was just shooting video, and there were some boys playing behind basketball behind me. Uh, probably six, maybe seven, I don't know. 
uh, I never, I made a purpose not to shoot their, the boys playing basketball. You could hear them bouncing the ball and, and hollering in the background. I didn't want that in my video. This videotape I was making was to, to uh, document my daughter growing up. That was what new parents do. And that's just what I was doing. Cutie pie. Tommy quit. Teeter totter, teeter totter. Kelly, baby. Wee. Look at that Kelly. There's teeter totter in. Wee. Wee. Two days later, when it all broke the news that there was somebody missing, uh, I called uh, the Marion Police Department. I talked over my wife. She said, yeah, maybe we better call. So we called, said, hey, we were shooting video over, over there on Monday night. Uh, it was uh, after 5, 5.30, something like that. So uh, uh, one of them came out, uh, looked at the video, and I showed it to him in full speed, regular speed. Uh, really couldn't see anything. And then I, I slowed it down to frame by frame, and, and you could see a lot of the background, everything in the grass from the, in the, from the playground all the way back to the Seabold Pool. Just about everything in the grass you could see. Just, you know, if there was any paper or, or any little thing, you could see it in the grass. And you could see cars across the street in the little park they had across the street. Uh, you know, just a lot of it was hard, you know, detail as far as that goes for. Uh, for our technology we had back then, I don't know what they can pull up with it now. Retired Marion police officer Tim Inyert went into what details he could about this case, a case that has become very personal for the retired officer. Tim became close friends with the Reitler family and continues to support them. Well, from the beginning, it was apparent to me that we had a crime. Um, the, the, on Wednesday, when I when I, I went into work after finding out she was discovered, uh, I went out to the IWU area and I began to, to search the area. Uh, and that's when we uh, found her clothes. Um, I was able to find those clothes. Her meal card was in her jeans. Uh, and from there, we knew we had a crime. Uh, from, from the crime scene, we knew we had an abduction. We knew we had most likely uh, a rape, uh, and so it, we were treating it as a serious crime uh, had occurred at that point. It was no, we, there was no doubt. It's more than just a missing college student. I mean, a, a crime has occurred. Uh, Monday the 29th was a beautiful day. We had had a miserable spring, and the 29th, I mean, it was uh, sun was shining, 60s people were outside playing basketball, and finally spring has arrived. So uh, there, there wasn't any rain that I know of on the 29th. Uh, I couldn't tell you about the days after that, but, but uh, I, the clothing was not wet. I, I, when, when I discovered the clothing, it was not wet. Well, it's an interesting case. Uh, there's, there's three suspects. You really can't uh, positively say it's, it's none of the three. But if you go back and you examine what type of crime it is, it, it can lead you to think uh, you, you can probably check some people off and, and uh, may, you might want to look closer at, at others. And, and the crime is uh, uh, rape and abduction and most likely murder. Uh, so rape, I mean, most people learn uh, their sexual desires between age 15 and 25, and they repeat those desires over and over again. So if, uh, if this is, we're looking for a rapist, then there's chances are this person's done this crime already. There's, and if he hasn't done it, he'll do it again. Uh, so, so we might be looking for a serial offender here. Uh, secondly, um, uh, you, Tony Searcy, he um, flunked a polygraph, not once, but twice. He, inter he interjected himself into the crime. Uh, he went to the hospital that same night. He had a hernia. Uh, and so he, when, he, when he interjected himself into the crime, uh, it, it, you know, you, you definitely have to take a closer look at him. Uh, so so um, 
but he's been out of jail. He, we, he, he went to jail for a few years, not, not long, but a few years, uh, and he's been out ever since, and he's never repeated the crime. So assuming that uh, you have a serial rapist, that would say it's probably not Tony Searcy. Uh, and, you know, the polygraph is not uh, as reliable as we would like, like for it to be. It's only about 80% reliable, so, so it's probably not him. Larry Hall, he confessed to the crime. Uh, Larry Hall grew up in a cemetery. He uh, has a low IQ. Uh, he reads detective magazines and he follows, uh, you know, they made a big deal about a Civil War reenactment, but that's, that doesn't make him creepy or anything like that. But uh, he's, he's, he gets excited for whatever reason. He goes to other crime areas and interjects himself in, in the area, just looking out of fascination or whatever. So the, the problem I have with Larry Hall doing this, even though he confessed to it, uh, is the fact that he can't give any specific details. That's number one. Number two, uh, he's, he has a very low IQ. And whoever did this uh, planned, planned it, and they could uh, put their thoughts together. And Larry Hall really just can't put his thoughts together. I don't think he's smart enough to do uh, pull this off. Uh, and then the, the third stuff, uh, third suspect would be Donald Grenier, who uh, went to a Marsh supermarket in in um, um, Hartford City and abducted a, a little girl. And three days later, the little girl escaped, uh, which led to his arrest. Uh, so here you have uh, a, a guy that very, he's in his 40s at this time, very well could be a serial uh, rapist, serial killer, uh, and abductor. So can we prove that? No. But if you go back in the crimes that have occurred, Wendy Felton, 1987, Trisha Reitler, 1993, and then this young girl in 1999, you know, every six years, uh, we had, we had a serious crime and we know he did one of them. And we know he lived in the area of uh, Marsh South where Wendy Felton and Trisha Reitler was abducted. Donald Grenier is under the supervision of the Department of Corrections in Pendleton Correctional Facility, Indiana. He was charged with the abduction and molestation of a nine-year-old girl in 1999. Grenier's home was searched for evidence concerning the disappearance of Trisha Reitler. The search of Grenier South J Street, Marion Home produced no evidence linking to Trisha's disappearance. Hey, Donnie, come on in! Donnie, I know you heard me, come on in! I didn't really know anything about the guy, I just knew he was my neighbor. And then just one day, it's just like, all hell broke loose. <laughs> I mean, I'm just outside playing basketball, and you know, you got Grant County Sheriff's and state troopers that roll up, swarm his house, and then it turned out uh, he had kidnapped a young girl from Hartford City, and she actually escaped on, I think it was Easter Sunday. And uh, that's how they got him. They got him for kidnapping. and. Uh, I remember I was outside and I watched him just walk him out to the car and then uh, 
few days later, um, detectives came over asking a couple questions. And then before I know it, they had uh, cadaver dogs, um, an FBI out here digging up his backyard. Um, and from what I understood, they'd found uh, human remains, I believe it was a jawbone. Uh, and when they did the pathology test on that, I think it came back to a male jawbone. So yeah, like I was saying, um, right behind me is where he lived with his mother. And uh, like I said, yeah, I used to go in there, man, when I was just maybe 13, 14 years old, selling stuff for sports. And, you know, and that, that time I really didn't, I mean, I just knew him as the one-armed neighbor. I didn't really, you know, converse back and forth with him as far as that went. I mean, every now and again, he'd, he'd wave or nod when he'd drive by. But, um, yeah, he was just quiet. Yeah, and then this is the, the building that we were told that he had held the young girl that he kidnapped. He held her captive inside there for, uh, like I said, 25 hours. And then she escaped uh, on Easter Sunday. I remember that, that morning specifically. Tony Searcy, a habitual criminal offender, has also long been considered a possible suspect in the Reitler case. He has denied all involvement and authorities have never arrested Searcy in connection with Reitler's disappearance. Searcy had been in legal trouble with Indiana Wesleyan University prior to Trisha's disappearance. Tony Searcy's girlfriend at the time also worked with Trisha in the campus cafeteria. Speaking with reporters for the first time since Trisha's disappearance, Trisha's sister Sarah Boros sits down with 27 Unsolved. Trisha, growing up, she was my best friend. She was our big sister, and she was fun, nonstop fun, is how I would describe her. But the night my parents got the phone call, it was late, it was, I believe, right after midnight, and I remember my dad coming into my room, waking me up and asking for a friend's phone, a friend of Trisha's phone number, and then explained that they had just gotten a call from the police department that said they could not find Trisha. So that is my first memory of knowing there was an issue going on. So that night, after we did get the original call, we had a bunch of friends and family come over. Everybody was in a panic, not knowing exactly what was going on or exactly what to do. And that morning, I remember my parents leaving to go to Indiana to start the search. We, still not knowing exactly how serious it was, the siblings stayed home. I think the turning point was when we got the call from my mom and dad who were in Indiana that told us that they had found her clothes. And it's at that point I remember my sister Melissa and I standing there in the hallway, hugging and crying and realizing that we probably would never see our sister again. I think at this point, we do need some new eyes on it, some somebody fresh to look at it. Um, it 27 years is a long time to be looking for someone and though you might not always physically be looking for them mentally you feel like you are looking for them all the time anybody that could come in and help would be wonderful at this point the older i get the more i do find myself searching for her even social media pictures coming up on whether it's facebook twitter whatever it might be and having seeing someone that looks similar to her and doing a double take and then realizing a timelines don't add up the it, it's not her and it's a punch to the gut every time that happens i think if i had a chance to talk to who who took trisha at this point it's not about being angry it's not about getting back at them about even punishment. I think help us, help us find her, tell us what happened. It Mentally, it is so hard to continue for 27 years wondering. It's the questions can run on and on and on in your head and it would not be nice to make those stop and 
just peace for the entire family. My parents, the other siblings, my brother and sister. I mean, we're all in the same boat here. And just knowing, help us, help us find her. She deserves to be found. Nobody should be out there. And we've been 27 years is a very long time to be searching for someone. I love when my mom tells me how much I remind her of my sister. We were very, very close growing up. Like I said, she was my best friend. Um, a lot of our mannerisms are the same. Our expressions, our excitement about life are the same. I think that's when I feel the closest to her is when people tell me how much I remind them of her. It does feel like there was a before Trisha and an after Trisha part of my life and I think the whole family feels that way and a lot of times we find ourselves saying oh that was before Trisha disappeared or that was after Trisha disappeared it was definitely a life changed life was never the same after that it everything changed after that so I I don't necessarily feel that my my childhood was ruined by it but it it changed a lot of things. Life was never the same after March 29th, 1993. Our crew went to Olmsted, Ohio to speak with parents of Tricia, Donna and Gary Reitler, both telling 27 Unsolved how after 27 years, they still seek answers. Um, Tricia was born in Berea, Ohio, and she was an incredible child. She was very curious. She was <laughs> very precocious. She uh, got in a lot of trouble. As a little girl, she was very strong-willed, uh, uh, very uh, headstrong, and uh, but very loving as well. Very bossy, being the firstborn. Um, she was a mother to her other siblings, and um, she loved life. She was full of life. She was uh, into sports. She played uh, basketball. She uh, was a great defensive player in playing basketball. Offensively, she was so-so, but she was a good defensive player. She wanted to put broken families back together, and that was her dream. Her and I had a, a, a very good relationship, you know, growing up. Of course, there was uh, uh, rough times, you know, but uh, they all seemed to smooth out. She worked very hard at school, and um, she was there on a scholarship and worked really hard to maintain that, and um, very athletic. Gosh, she was kind of like the whole package. Of course, I'm her mother, so I can say that. <laughs> so. She went to the particular college that she went to, Indiana Wesleyan, kind of dragging her feet a little bit. Uh, she didn't want to go there. and. And we pushed her to go. And there's a couple of reasons. Uh, it was a Christian college, so that was important to us. And also, uh, she was able to get some scholarships there to lessen the burden of sending her there. And it didn't take long. I think she adapted to it very well. She she liked the college, and I think became very excited about going back the the next year. He got to the phone first, and a, I believe her name was Detective Dunn, called and asked us if we knew where Trisha was. And it was like, what do you mean? Um, Trisha's at college, and um, she's not here. And obviously, you know, the alarms went off. Well, it was about 12.30 on a Wednesday evening, and I wasn't feeling very well, so I was just laying on the couch. And I wasn't particularly sick, but just, just wasn't feeling well. Donna had gone to bed, and uh, the phone rang, and uh, it startled me. I was maybe in and out of sleep, half asleep, when, uh, when the phone rang, and I got to the phone just before Donna did, and uh, the first words out were, says, uh, is, this is Lieutenant Dunn from the Marion Police Department. Do you know where Trisha is? And at that moment, my heart just sank, because I knew something was wrong. Um, her day, the day that she disappeared, um, was very um, normal for her. She was a runner. She ran, I guess, two or three times that day. It was the first beautiful day in Marion. So um, everybody was out, you know, and about. And um, it was un unseasonably warm that day, so she took advantage of it. I know she had gone to the gym um, when we got to her room. 
Um, she used to exercise to the same um, television program I would exercise in the morning. It was it was kind of funny. She would call me up and she'd say, "Hey, did you did you see what wasn't that a bad workout? You know." So it was a bonding kind of thing. And she had gone to the gym and her her tennis shoes were in a room and along with her step platform that her dad had made her. Um, so she enjoyed the day. She had a term paper that was coming up. She worked hard on that term paper. And um, from what we understand, um, her route, she asked her roommate to go with her to, um, to Marsh. And um, for whatever reason, I don't remember what the reason was, but um, Belinda said, didn't go or Belinda wasn't feeling well or something. I can't remember exactly what it was. So Trisha ended up going by herself. Now she was seen going to Marsh. We do know that. Um, she waved. There were basketball players that were playing. Supposedly she waved to them and I don't know why we know that. I can't remember who told us that. But so she walked to Marsh. Um, she went to Marsh. She also went to the drugstore that was next door. She purchased um, an item. She was seen in the drugstore, I believe, or it was Marsh, one of them, by a student that went to school with her. She, you know, she said hello to him or whatever. And um, and so then after that, she went and got it. You know, she got a diet soda. She got a magazine, and I knew exactly what magazine it was, and it, and that was the magazine she purchased. They had the receipt for that. That was found next to the road and um, a lady picked it up and it was a receipt for a Fago diet root beer and a Family Circle magazine was in the bag. Um, from that, um, we assumed she was on her way home and um, or on her way back to her dorm room and she was abducted. And the next day or the day after she was reported missing, they found her clothing in a, in a field of trees. Um, which is very hard for me to understand because um, the area was not uh, extremely wooded. It was open, it, a lot of traffic. Um, every time we went there, and we went there many times, drove back and forth, um, it was lit. It was, it was open. I can't believe somebody didn't see something. We know there was a screen uh, about eight, 40 something. We know that somebody heard a scream at that point. We do know that. That's documented. Um, and she hadn't been seen since. So uh, what happened? I don't know. I don't know why the basketball players have never come forward. That That's a real red flag for me. Um, we've made plea after plea for anybody that day. I mean, it was it was so much in the news that anybody that was there at that time, it, it, it's hard for me to understand that they didn't know that they were being asked to come forward. Um, and that's, that's basically what we know. I mean, other than that, we're still here 27 years later with no answers. Well, when he, from my, well, my memory says they were not folded, but they were, they were somewhat laid out, laid out, and they, uh, the, the shoes were, were nearby, you know, they weren't crumpled up in a ball, but they looked as if they were forcibly taken off, and there were grass stains on the, uh, on the jeans, uh, there was, uh, uh, blood on, on the, on the clothing, um, it was the clothes were found in a, a in a very open area. There was a few small trees nearby. It was no more than about 75 feet off of the road. There was a elementary school nearby. Basketball courts. In the night she disappeared, there were play. There was uh, people out there playing basketball. It was near the uh, the public uh, swimming pool, uh, the Aqua Dome. Uh, there was uh, evidence found back behind the aquadome. Uh, so it, but when we went there, you know, it was nothing like I envisioned. When they told us about it, I envisioned this very secluded spot, uh, an area where, you know, basically uh, th th nobody would be able to, to see what was going on. And, and totally opposite of that, it was so wide open, I was, I was, I was astonished.
Um, as, as far as the suspects go and um, what suspects we have and maybe my gut feeling, I, I don't know. Circumstances are hard to pinpoint on some of them, and but our strongest to me is Larry Hall. Um, just by what I know from other law enforcement, FBI that's working on the case, um, people that have known him, um, circumstances that he was in, stalking girls, even right after Trisha disappeared, he was, uh, you know, he was stopped on campus, um, things that were found in his van. I would say to me, Larry Hall would be um, my strongest suspect because really, other than that, we don't have much to go on. Seriously, we don't. Um, there's a lot that that seems to hang, you know, with Larry Hall. But um, once again, I it's I don't know. I don't. I really don't know. You know, I think that's one of the most frustrating things for us is that there have been suspects, you know, that have come up uh, two or three. Uh, the the most viable one is Larry Hall. He. Uh, I guess he he quite often would stalk people in his van, you know, uh, young girls. That uh, he had done that in the past, prior to Trisha disappearing. He also did it uh, after Trisha disappeared. Um, he uh, has a history of, uh, I think, doing nefarious things similar to that. Um, you know, I think the one of the things that ties Larry into Trisha, you know, fairly deeply is the fact that he has confessed three times. He's uh, rescinded those, he's, he's taken them back, but when under pressure he has three times uh, confessed at uh, killing Trisha. Um, a year after Trisha disappeared, he, Larry Hall was uh, picked up in Gas City for stalking the two young girls. When he was pulled over, they found in his van um, a Indiana Wesleyan uh, stationery with her name typewritten on it. They found uh, duct tape and tarps and uh, uh, numerous things, ether, uh, rope. Um, they also found at that time notes in his van uh, talking about what he needed to do, uh, clean the van. Uh, by line, uh, take the wheels off, you know, take the, get the mud off of the van, um, now buy a shovel, uh, you know, uh, then he also had some uh, uh, addresses on there which have subsequently, subsequently been followed up on but have led to nothing. Um, so Larry Hall seems to be the biggest suspect. He actually confessed that night when he was picked up, took the police to a location where he said that he had buried Trisha and that nothing came out of that. Um, and then there's other suspects as well. Uh, Tony Searcy has come up as a, as a suspect. You know, there's just a lot of circumstantial evidence uh, on him. Uh, he was out and about that night, uh, had contacted the police. Um, and also, Donald Vernier is another suspect to, that has come up. And I think the, 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 the most frustrating thing about any one of them, it's, it's everybody has their own opinion who, who it might have been, and it's all circumstantial. There's nothing there, there's nothing to go on, there's nothing to follow up on. And we can kind of vacillate back and forth to saying, I think one day we think it's Larry Hall. The next day we, we might think it's, it's, it's Tony or Donald Grenier or even, you know, maybe somebody else. You know, could it have been one of the basketball players? We just don't know. And I think it's, 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 it's imperative for us that if anybody out there has any information whatsoever, if they, even if they think it's just the smallest thing, to come forward and share that information with us. As far as DNA testing on any of the evidence found, I don't know that. I mean, I know there was DNA testing on her clothing that they found. I know that they've done DNA testing on that. Um, DNA testing has come a long way since 1993. 
Um, so we were told that um, certain things they tested then, um, like blood and stuff that was on her clothes, um, and evidence they found behind the aqueduct, that um, they used up whatever blood. We didn't even have her blood type. We didn't. We just didn't. And so it was kind of hard to distinguish what was what, but um, we were told that it was used up, the, the DNA. So I, I don't know. D DNA testing has come far. So um, as far as what they've tested recently, we were told they, they sent out her clothes and things recently, but nothing was found. Uh, you know, I just took a trip to Alabama and it was a you know ten hour trip, and you know it's it could come out of the blue. You could be driving down the road, and you see a a, a trash bag on the side of the road, or you see a, an old discarded tarp, and your mind automatically goes back to the fact that you know could that be Trisha? I mean, you know what? It realistically it doesn't make any sense, but your mind automatically goes back to that. You know, you want to stop and you want to look. And you know that that's silly. You know that it's it's stupid. After all these years, um, I do believe that it has come to a dead end. Her case, I do believe that um, as time goes on, things aren't as fresh. As time goes on, leads dry up. As time goes on, which makes me sad, uh, law enforcement retires. Um, people pass away. You know, my fear is that whoever's responsible or has that one piece of information, um, it's been 27 years, um, that, you know, there's a possibility they won't be here much longer. Um, I, I would like, personally, fresh eyes on the case. I, I am grateful for what the Marion Police Department has done. They've always been very kind to us. They have always helped us um, Whenever we've had any crazy idea, they followed through. Um, I, I feel like we have a good relationship with them, but I truly would like to see um, either it uh, classified as a cold case and then maybe something open up differently. Fresh eyes, uh, somebody working on it again, um, wholeheartedly. And I think as a father, not being able to, I guess, come to her rescue or to find her, that's one of the hardest things that I've had to go through. All I know is we need answers, you know? And, and I need to feel like Trish is important and not just on the back burner. And I know that's my mother's heart speaking because I know that that can't always be the case. They have other things too. But Trisha's not just a case. And, and that's the hard thing because Trisha is my daughter. Um, and I wish that people knew her. And I just wish we could find her. I think keeping her story alive is helps keep us alive to to some degree. We we don't know where she is. Uh, we can't rest. We can't we can't we can't move forward until we find her. And I think that keeping it alive, doing something like this, and talking about it, maybe somebody will hear something. Maybe they'll come forward with it, maybe they have some information. And so whenever we have the opportunity to keep her story alive, we, we take advantage of that, hoping that someday somebody will come forward with some information that will lead us in the right direction. You will never know what you took from us. I wish you could meet Trisha. I wish you could have known who Trisha really was. Uh, she was somebody that would have made a difference in this world. And I believe that she would have forgiven you. I believe that 
She would have helped you if you needed help because that's who she was. And um, I'll, I'll just never understand it. It won't. You know, she just was going about her life and doing what she did best. And she meant so much to so many people. I we just want to bring her home. I would, I think what I would say if I was to meet the person, the question would be why? Why did you do this? You know, I, I, think, I think I would want to know that. Uh, we have long gone past the, the, the anger and the, the, uh, uh, the revenge part of this. I think I would just want to know why. You know, <laughs> the Lord says vengeance is mine. You know, we, that's not our, our goal anymore. Our goal is to bring Trisha home. We want her home. We want to have a place that we can visit. We want to have a place that we can go to. Um, so I think my question would be, why? Why did you do this? 27 years have passed, and I think it's time. If you have any information, if anybody out there has any information, please come forward with it. Even the smallest bit of information gives us a direction to go, gives us a, an avenue to pursue. So I just plead for anybody, if you have any information, this, no matter how small it is, please call the police department, call somebody, talk to somebody, and, and let them know what you know. Our prayers continue for the Reitler family in hopes that they will soon get the answers that they need. I'm John Humphreys, and thank you for watching 27 Unsolved. This is Thomas Raw, uh, Rawlings, and he. I'm friends with him. On the I know police so department I. has this in as evidence. <laughs> I mean, so many times you've even questioned whether or not the basketball players were real, and then hearing them in the background, it's. They are real. They were there. It, it's not just a figment of our imagination. There, there truly were people there that could come forward and help us with this. Yeah. Yeah. Watching this video, I find myself I, scanning the background looking mm -hmm. for her, just mm -hmm. like always. I, yeah. it, and to know that when you see the playground here and she was alive right over here. Yeah. And, and three days just later, walked and three days later, we were standing there looking for her. You know, I mean, it was a beautiful day, and it just takes you back immediately to that. I can still remember the houses behind it, the way that aqueduct looked, all of it. And yeah. it's a screenshot in time of what that was, what that used to be. Yeah. It's so hard to believe that she was alive right over yes. there when that's playing. Yep. Yep. And I probably should back up and say the night before, you know, when on Sunday night, they had called to do room checks on us and um, as they did with the freshmen and um, you know I looked on Trisha's bed and there was like a lump of her blankets and so um, I assumed she was in her bed and that's what I had told the the um, the people who were doing the room checks I said yeah Trisha's in for the night um, not truly knowing if she was in on Sunday night um, and I look back on that now and I really don't think, you know, Monday was truly the day. I think probably Sunday night was probably the day that all this happened. Um, even though, you know, Monday was the day that everything was kind of documented. I just really hope for, for their sake and um, the family's sake as well as mine that somebody out there will indeed come forward that has more answers than we do. Um, and just provide those answers for us to help us, um, you know, bring Trisha home and put her to, um, 
you know, a final resting place. 